here's my fan rewrite of The Last Jedi. I've tried to fix a variety of narrative mistakes while also trying to maintain the original ideas of certain scenes, but making them much more palatable to the audience. The idea of subversion or a deconstruction, uh, yeah, that's not going to happen. You don't do that with a trilogy. You don't do that with the eighth movie of a series. That's silly. Uh, there are expectations, of course. There are plot threads. Uh, there are questions that need answering. I, I've listed a few in the description of this video if you're curious to see which ones I did. Poe is preparing to give terms of surrender to Hux, and Hux and him are talking about the details. This gives him enough time to juice up his engines, and the same scene continues. Uh, there's no silly mobile phone commentary, there's no mom joke, there's none of that. He's just trying to surrender, he's negotiating how to make that possible, and then boom, off he goes. He's just buying time. Poe is still a crazy flyboy, and Hux is still a gullible idiot. Instead of bombers, the Resistance has X-Wings, and the X-Wings use missiles instead of artificial gravity bombs. Uh, maybe one or two X-Wings get destroyed. Regardless, they end up taking down the huge dreadnought thanks to Poe. His stalling tactic and him being crazy good in taking down all those anti-fighter guns. It's hard to believe, but this scene is supposed to be exciting and action-packed, so we keep it. So, we remove the Snoke force choke scene where he's seen uh, teleconferencing with, or video conferencing with Hux and choking him from afar. Who knows how far away he is? It seems to be like light years away. If that's the case, then uh, Snoke or any other powerful Sith can just uh, Skype call anyone and choke them to death, and that would be the end of pretty much every movie. So, getting rid of that entirely. <laughs> So the rest of the First Order arrive, and they use one ship called an Interdictor, which is part of Kennen, which stops starships from going into hyperspace. So now no one in the area within a certain distance can hyperspace away. Uh, this is important because if you could hyperspace away, you'd hyperspace to a safe place. Uh, therefore, fuel is a non-issue. It's rather irrelevant whether it's a, a little or a lot left of fuel, especially since the Republic are the dominating force in the galaxy and not the First Order. They would just hyperspace to a safe place and boom, they get all the support they needed. So to fix this slow space chase scene, you turn it into a hyperspace trap with no communication. So as a result, the First Order uses calm jamming so no one can call for help. And thus the Resistance has to solve this problem themselves. Also there's a lot less First Order Star Destroyers, they're supposed to be remnants. They're not this giant empire as they used to be, so they should have a small number of ships going after the Radis. So Poe is back on the Radis and she's, he's talking to Leia uh, and you know they're going all over his crazy maneuver and he does not get demoted. She's angry because he nearly got everyone killed and they need a good leader for their X-Wing squadrons. He might, she might also say something about uh, how he lied and that's not the Resistance way. We have to be truthful and, and honorable. Uh, that could be an, uh, an underlying theme for Poe's arc, why not? Nonetheless, the First Order begin their attack on the Radis, launching TIE fighters as normal. Additionally, they also start to maneuver one of their Star Destroyers away to then get out of the Interdictor's hyperspace radius or non-hyperspace radius, so it can then hyperspace in front of the Radis and then restore it. This is a basic pincer maneuver. So Leia and Akbar are aware of this on their scanners. Leia decides to move to the front of the ship to prepare for the attack of the pincer movement, while Akbar stays on the bridge. She'll wear all this cool armor for combat and lead her troops in if ever there's going to be a boarding. Instead of Finn walking around like an idiot looking for Rey while he's oozing water or whatever, the camera follows Poe as he walks up to Medbay and helps Finn out of bed. Finn says he's getting these headaches, but he and the medical droids don't really know what's going on. Finn is still concerned about Rey, uh, and in this case, there's no need for Rose in this scenario, or her little sister, or a big sister, or whomever. Uh, there's no need for Canto Bite. We suddenly have lots of time and money to play with actual scenes that matter. So Luke Force pulls the lightsaber to him. He pulls it apart with his mind, and we see all the little components. We see the kyber crystal. We saw it coming apart and coming back together. Uh, this is just to show off that Luke is pretty darn amazing. He doesn't need to lift a finger if he doesn't want to. He then pushes it back into Rey's hands. Uh, we could show maybe a flashback or, or have him tell her how it came into Maz Kanata's hands, but that's really not important in this scene right now. He immediately sits down, she does the same, and he says nothing. 
And then we cut to another scene. It's a slow, big, epic scene where nothing has to really happen that's big and nothing has to be said. So then we cut back to Ray. Uh, they're still sitting together, but Ray is getting impatient. She's about to talk, but Luke says, Patience. This is my most valuable lesson to you. If you do not have patience, you will die. They sit around like this for a few seconds longer, and then Luke just sighs, says, Okay, time is a bit short. I shall give you three lessons. The first lesson he teaches is defensive combat. So lightsaber form five or shin. This is pretty much what Luke was the best at or most known for in the, the novels, I believe. Uh, regardless of exactly what they do, there has to be a, a defensive stance or a, a technique that is clearly seen by the audience to say, oh, okay, that's she's doing the thing she's learned. Uh, and we see that later in the movie. That's very important. So we get the visual understanding of what she's doing. The second lesson is force abilities, specifically lifting stones. Uh, this is standard in Jedi training. They have these uh, meditation stones called Muntur stones, each of which weigh a ton. Only if you can lift them simultaneously, and Rey can only do one barely. Uh, but because she's so powerful and she doesn't have really good control, she launches that one stone in the air, and uh, it has to match some of the part of this movie. So it's a scene where the, the wheelbarrow gets smashed by a rock she cut in two. So in this case, she, she manages to hold it uh, so that it doesn't kill the nun, and she apologizes, and ha ha, very funny. The third lesson that Luke teaches her is mysticism or philosophy of the Force and its shortcomings. So basically combine the breathing scene with the scene inside the tree temple area. The dark side, you know, whatever that is, what the chosen one is, uh, his father, about Kylo, and about her. She has a special connection to Anakin we don't quite understand yet. It's through her... Uh, and her next conflict, that she will discover what her destiny is. So we're setting up Ray to come to some future realization where she'll have to make a choice. The same scene with Ray being able to, to sense Luke, or sorry, being unable to sense Luke because he's hidden himself from the Force, even though he can still manipulate it, uh, he's taught himself how to suppress his abilities all this time. So we're, he's essentially become this giant battery of the Force, and he's hiding from Snoke, and he's just biding his time, which we'll get into later. So we get a video montage of all this, uh, her meditating, her lifting stones, her fighting, and her getting better at all these things. Maybe she's helping Luke hunt for food. Uh, you know, fishing would be cool. Fighting that sea monster would have been a cool idea. Uh, you know, and just absolutely no lactating sea creatures. That's just silly. So combine that with her visions of the lightsaber and Anakin, and, and we're all curious where this is all leading. She's having problems with the vision still, but... They're not hurting her as much. She can cope, uh, even though it's a, it's a painful thing for her to go through. So while she's learning about the Force, the montage stops, and we, we focus on one scene, and she tries to force command Luke to come help him and help fight. And he starts going through the motions, you know, jokingly, pretending he's going to go along with her and saying, where exactly did you pick this up? And she says, it came naturally. Well, she can do that on normal people now for no problem, so it might be pretty helpful for her in the future. Maybe a scene where she tells a porg to go to sleep. We can do that. But she can't do it on the nuns for some reason. So you just don't piss off those nuns. So there's a little nod to showing this was a natural talent of hers. But obviously it won't work on force users, especially not him. Luke then commands her to do something and she immediately does it. Uh, like, a, like a silly dance or like a chicken or whatever. Just something funny. This subverts the, the seriousness of all of this. So it's kind of a... Uh, thing, yeah, obviously Luke is going to train her, but it's going to be sort of tongue-in-cheek. She's really powerful, but she's not very good at it. And Luke is, of course, a Jedi Master doing all this. So Rey now has some control and some skill in Force suggestions. There's still that beautiful scene that we're going to keep with R2 and Luke, where R2 shows the message from Leia from long ago, and Luke is still reluctant to go and do anything yet. We then cut to an action scene where Kylo is attacking the bridge of the Radis, this shows that Rey is busy training while the Rass is getting attacked to show the jumps from action to training scenes where a sense of time at least is relative to what's going on here. Uh, Akbar gets attacked on the bridge. He survives though, just barely. Uh, he's sent to sick bay and they give him a splint. Uh, he's, he's up and about still. He's got a cane, but he's pretty strong. He's a badass and he's still giving orders like nothing changed for him. Luke talks about the great Sith Lord that was hidden to everyone. No one's really sure where he came from, 
but he emerged after the death of Palpatine. Luke starts explaining that the First Order was being built in secret, and no one knew about it until recently. This explains how he was able to amass power and funds even though he was being a remnant of the Empire. He tells her about how he failed Kylo, and that's all the same as it was in the movie. So Rey starts being force bonded to Kylo, and she thinks it's because of her training, and all that occurs in the movie that is all the same. Luke then explains to Rey that he believes Snoke's origins and powers are mostly related to mental tricks, like Luke warns that Snoke was the person who influenced Kylo Ren, uh, and what he's been doing ever since. Luke couldn't quite figure out what was going on at the time, and now he's scared of Snoke, but he's scared that Snoke can influence his mind, and that's why he's in hiding, so he doesn't become a force of the Sith against all the things he loves and wants to protect. A key scene for Rey is the dark side mirror image scene, and she sees her being torn from her mom, and it's the same idea from the previous movie, still not very clear. So she sees herself again, and herself is looking back and saying, we are the Force. She doesn't understand that, and the vision just ends. One of the major problems with Luke in The Last Jedi was when he drew his lightsaber on Kylo in his bedroom. So to fix that, well, instead what happens is we see Snoke in front of Kylo's bed talking to him, and then Luke walks in and then draws his lightsaber on Snoke. Now Snoke's image just disappears, and then Kylo wakes up, and then he naturally freaks out. This is how Luke explains what Snoke is. His abilities are projecting thoughts across very long distances, and this is where Rey is about to tell Luke about her meeting with Kylo and the bond they have, and what she saw in the mirrors, but now she's really hesitant. Is Luke telling the truth? Is Kylo telling the truth? She's not sure. So immediately the next scene is when we have the scene of Kylo talking to Rey in the hut, and Luke walks in. It's pretty much an exact callback to what we were just shown, where Snoke was talking to Kylo. So when Luke sees this, he blows the whole hut to pieces, and this makes sense because we know why he's so pissed. So we find out that Kylo killed all of Luke's students, and Rey is told that Snoke influenced Kylo to the dark side. Luke gets excited, tells her to leave the island, and the air around him is all dark, and it's getting, it's getting darker in the distance, getting some clouds going, it starts thundering, the rain starts pouring. He doesn't really get angry, but you can tell the sky around him in the background is thundering, and he's saying some harsh words to Rey about Snoke, and uh, you know, Snoke can now possibly find him, how you could be influenced by, by Kylo. Uh, you know, Snoke may be going through Kylo to, to Rey to get to him, and he doesn't know how powerful Snoke is yet, and he's getting more, more fierce with every sentence. Again, Jedi Master, in control of his emotions, but can tell from the background what he's really thinking internally. He's having this massive war going on in his head. So Luke and Rey get into an argument, they end up fighting. This is where Luke does all his dodging maneuvers, even force blocking Rey's swings. His stick is totally fine, the weather is getting really rainy and really thundery as it was before. And when he picks her up and he's about to toss her off a cliff or something, to subvert this scene, one of the nuns comes over and coughs to interrupt whatever they're doing. She looks up at him like, hey, I mean, what are you doing with this weather, you crazy wizard man? You know, in that quiet Muppet sort of way. And Luke says, oh, oh, I, I'm really sorry, in that sort of nice Mark Hamill sort of way. So the clouds just instantly dissipate. Luke starts saying, uh, you know, there is no emotion, there is peace. There is no emotion, there is peace. He takes a deep breath, and he's back to his old self. Okay, Rey is really kind of scared right now, and immediately runs to the tree temple thing, looks at the books. The next scene is her taking her bag, which looks strangely larger for some reason, goes up to Luke and says, I swore I would return with you. If I can't return with you, I will try and turn Kylo good. Uh, Luke says something very similar to what Yoda said to him on Dagobah, you are not ready. You must complete your training. If you face Snoke, you will die and Rey just ends up flying off with Chewie, just like before. Luke begins to be distraught, he's getting emotional, he, he's, his control over his suppression of the Force is just is like letting go. Uh, he's like Force pushing rocks out of his way. Uh, so he goes off to destroy the books, because Snoke could possibly have access to them now that he's revealed his powers a bit. Uh, instead of, you know, feeling any, any negative power or Snoke with him, Yoda pops up and tells him that Rey took the books, and that it doesn't matter because failure is the greatest teacher, 
and Ray will learn that lesson the hard way, the same as you did. Luke says that even if Ray converts Kylo, she will still die from Snoke. Then Anakin's ghost pops up, then Obi-Wan's ghost pops up, Qui-Gon, and pretty soon that whole area of the island near the temple is filled with Force ghosts, and they're all looking to Luke. And Luke suddenly asks, where were you after all this time? Why didn't you help me while I struggled with protecting myself from the galaxy, from Snoke, from the Sith? And Yoda says, we've always been here. You shut yourself off so you couldn't sense us. But now time it is for you to leave. Save the girl you must, or she will surely perish. So Luke now looks to Anakin and Obi-Wan, and this gives Luke more motivation to get off his ass and help people. You know, there's all these old Jedi masters who are putting their bets on Luke, so he better wisen up. The second Star Destroyer in the Pincer Movement finally arrives and attacks the Radis. We get more space battles with Poe and his X-Wings. And during this scene, the X-Wings are still fighting the TIE Fighters and the Star Destroyer, so it's jumping between the spaceship battle and the boarding fights. Akbar orders Poe to help stay in formation, to help defend the ship properly, after he just got an X-Wing Rebel fighter killed for breaking formation. So he follows orders, and his Wingman and him end up defeating a lot more TIE Fighters, and this is all done together as a team, and Poe learns to listen to his superiors, and thus succeed. Akbar then gives Poe control of the battlefield while he runs down to the front of the ship to help fight off the invaders. And Akbar's just ready to kick ass, and he drops his cane, he's got that splint on his leg, he picks up a big gun, and off he goes limping. So Leia, who's in front of the ship and is preparing to deal with the boarding party, gets knocked back by an explosion as they breach the hull, uh, somehow manage to bypass the shields and, and the hangar bay. The debris from the explosion knocks her out, and she's got, she's not in a coma or anything like that, but she's surviving via the force or whatever. Uh, there's no depressurization, there's no giant hole, but she's still unconscious under rubble, and no one can see her. She's effectively hidden and stuck. That uh, beacon bracelet she's got just falls off like before. And of course, there's obviously no scene with her flying through space. We then immediately jump back to Luke, and he has sensed that Leia has been hurt and is now calling out to him. Luke was standing at the sea, the edge of the, the cliff, and was about to raise the X-Wing like back in Dagobah, but instead of raising it now from the water, he just parts the goddamn sea. He's back, he's no longer suppressing himself, he's fully awake. The sun is shining, it's bright, there's wind behind him. Things are just coming together and so forth. And, well, he's ready to go. And then we cut to Snoke. Snoke senses this. He's, he's smiling, he's this evil Palpatine smile. He's like, finally, I found you. So the water parts, the X-Wing is magically being uh, put together. All the water is draining from it. The systems are being turned on. He lifts the X-Wing right to the ledge and he walks up into it and he flies off. We then cut to Finn, who's now manning a turn on the Radis, that which is good for, uh, but he gets attacked, so he has to retreat. Uh, very similar to as before, he's running through the rubble, and he sees Leia's bracelet on the ground. He doesn't see Leia, she's hidden, so he picks it up and he wears it. And eventually we get a boarding party with Captain Phasma, and he ends up getting captured by her, but not before he gives her a few shots with his blaster onto her helmet, but they deflect off her, so now he knows he's screwed. So Finn is being overwhelmed by the First Order forces. The rebels are taking cover in the Radis's hangar, and this action is all going on very quickly. Then we jump to Luke, who's flying through hyperspace, and he's telepathically telling Leia to get up, to breathe, to focus. So Leia just gets up, and the rubble in that explosion just flies off her. After that, she just picks up her blaster. She kind of goes commando. So she takes out a few stormtroopers, saves Finn, and then Akbar finally arrives, and of course he's the, the grizzled veteran, so he just drives everyone back with his blaster. Uh, Leia saves Finn, but somehow Phasma still managed to hold on to Finn, and the First Order boarding party escapes with what little stormtroopers are left, and they take Finn with them. Rey, after all this time, finally makes it back to the battle, and she's looking back and seeing this big spaceship. Uh, remember, she can't go very fast because of the interdictor uh, jamming all the hyperspace options. Uh, but she checks that there's a jamming signal too, so she still doesn't know what's going on exactly. But she does check her bracelet and realize that the signal is on the Radis, but she can sense that Kylo is on the Supremacy, so she changes course to go out to the Supremacy instead. She then uses the escape pod and goes there. Kylo takes her, 
and all that happened in the movie. So Ray meets up with Snoke in his throne room. He starts telling her a story that Ray's father was the Force, just like Darth Vader. Uh, Kylo is freaking out over holding Darth Vader's lightsaber and having some kind of visions with it. Uh, Phasma is interrogating Finn and asking about how he destroyed Starkiller Base. Uh, Finn is laughing at her because she can't believe she can't remember, let alone still be alive from that whole ordeal. Uh, Finn makes the connection that because Phasma Helmet is blaster-proof, a flashback of the scene in The Force Awakens doesn't make any sense anymore, where he was pointing a gun at her and threatening to shoot her in the head if she didn't drop the shields of Starkiller Base. And of course, she did what she was told. This is important because a normal person wouldn't be intimidated by a weapon that posed no danger to them. Now, sure, she was also tackled by Chewbacca, but after that, she could have pretty much taken them all apart since her suit of armor would have protected her, possibly even, even from Chewbacca's gun. So Finn starts getting that headache he was complaining about again, and he can feel the influence of, of Phasma telling him what to do, like a suggestion uh, to follow her orders and whatnot. He says, is this what these headaches are? And Finn looks around and he starts freaking out. So during a, a, a collage or a flashback scene with Finn reali realizing what's going on with Phasma and the brainwashing of stormtroopers, we immediately cut back to Snoke, who's been having this monologue where we discover that Snoke is a clone of Palpatine. And then we cut back to the antechamber from the throne room that was has a bunch of Phasma clones in suspension jars where Finn and Phasma are talking. So all these Gwendolyn Christie clones are lined up and she's part of the Knights of Ren, as it were. The Ren gene in genetics refers to the protein renin, or renin angiotensin, uh, which is a system which regulates blood pressure and the balance of fluids and salts in the body. So they use that as a base for creating the Knights. They added some of Kylo's DNA, and they now have some Force users, hence the Knights of Ren. So the normal clones are just good automatons, as they would be the recessive genes but they're still equally useful. So Snoke points to the, the Imperials when he's saying all this, uh, or the Imperial Guardsmen, uh, and Snoke is explaining that the spirit of Darth Plagueis will always be back to replace him if he should die. That explains what Palpatine was saying to Anakin about cheating death in the prequels. So essentially, we're facing Palpatine. So the First Order is called the First Order because if it ever, or if ever the body of the current Sith Lord were to fall, the First Order or the First Operation or task is to bring it back. Along with that, to rebuild the Empire and restore the Sith to be in charge. This explains why Snoke's body is all messed up, why he's a psychopath, why the Knights of Ren are either psychopaths or easily docile, and why Snoke has all these Force powers. For some reason, the, uh, the training to Finn wasn't quite perfect, so that's why he was getting headaches and why he was insubordinate in the first movie. Now in the books, there's clones of Force users which are usually disfigured or end up becoming psychopathic. Uh, the Imperial Guards in the room are a combination of easily influenced clones and recessive genes, so they're Force sensitive, but not Force users like Kylo is. And thus ends Snoke's monologue about how smart and how powerful this First Order system is. Snoke then plays on Rey's immaturity and that he needs to help train her to become strong and to give her a family, a sense of belonging, and to make it more disgusting in this conversation, to make her part of the First Order, which means she's getting cloned to protect both uh, Darth Plagueis' legacy and her power, whatever that means. But in order to do that, he needs her to go and kill Luke and steal his blood because it's more pure than Kylo's, so we can use it for cloning as well. While this is all happening, Snoke immediately force pulls Darth Vader's saber away from Kylo who's now really angry it's been taken away from him, but he's also really scared of Snoke, so he keeps his cool. So Snoke, of course, explains that he caused the Force bond between Rey and Kylo, and how he's imagining what he can do with Rey's genetics. So Snoke then summons Phasma to drag out Finn, saying that Rey needs to kill her past in order to become strong, so she can have the strength she needs to kill Luke. And if she can't do that right now, then Kylo will kill her. So we have this big standoff event. Now suddenly, Luke comes into the room. Snoke stands up and he's out of his chair. His, his eyes just light up. You know, Luke doesn't say anything. 
He's like radiating light. He's all unchanged. He's no, no longer suppressing his force power as he looks immaculate. And Snoke is just so excited to see this. Uh, he even comments that he can't even sense Luke even though he's right in the room. He starts rubbing his hands. He licks his lips. He just can't wait to add his fresh DNA to the First Order. He's really this, this crazy comic book villain. Uh, Snoke then orders Kylo to kill him. So Kylo says, you first, and he does the force pull lightsaber thing from Snoke's throne. Snoke was much too excited and too far away to notice the lightsaber, and boom, Snoke dies in exactly the same way, only he was standing up. Rey grabs the lightsaber like in the movie, exactly the same scene. Uh, Kylo's furious. He's about to attack Rey, but is suddenly reminded that there's a certain Jedi Master right behind him, so he's back into scared mode. Cut back to the Rattus. The pincer movement by the Star Destroyer has weakened the engines of the Rattus, even though they managed to destroy the attacking ship. Akbar says he has to go and save Finn and Rey. You know, no one gets left behind. That's he's kind of military-minded guy. Leia forbids it, but Akbar is adamant about this. Poe says he'll also go undercover and save Finn and help protect Akbar. Akbar's like, don't you mean I'll be protecting you? They've already commandeered a stranded TIE fighter that landed in the hangar bay, so Poe suits up all in black. Uh, he says this will also give the Resistance time to escape to the planet. Uh, Leia finds the bracelet that Finn dropped when he was picked up by Phasma, gives it to Akbar, telling him to use it to go find Rey and Finn. And Chewbacca makes his noise, and off they go to save Rey and Finn. So Chewbacca's, uh, you know, he's a prisoner. He's got his shackles going on, as always, and Akbar's hiding out in the Millennium Falcon. So Poe arrives at the Supremacy and tells them that He's found the map to the Skywalker on the Millennium Falcon, which he's had the tractor beam with on the TIE Fighter, so he needs to bring the Millennium Falcon into the hangar. Cut back to Leia, who orders everyone on the transport ships. This gives them the time to escape to the planet. Uh, this is going to be important later on. We then cut back to the fight scene. Uh, Kylo orders the Imperial Guard to stop Luke and Rey. Uh, Rey puts two and two together, looks at Captain Phasma, and Force persuades her to protect Finn like really strongly and Phasma's very susceptible so Phasma whips out her staff and does a very good job of protecting Finn. We see the training that Luke gave Rey. She does her signature defensive stance and maneuver again whatever that is. So now we have two of the three or four lessons that Luke gave her her fighting and her force persuasion being used. Rey tries to influence some of the Imperial Guards but fails and we know that since we were just told some of them were force sensitive, so Rey is trying things out. She's failing, she's not perfect anymore, but she's surviving. So with the help of Phasma, uh, being super productive of Finn, uh, Finn fighting with a blaster and Rey fighting with a lightsaber, they manage to escape into the antechamber. The camera pans back to a jar at the back of the room that suddenly lights up. And then we don't see it again. Ray notices her bracelet is shining and tells everyone that someone is here to rescue them. Kylo and a whole bunch of Imperial Guards have circled Luke. Uh, they start attacking him. Luke is just way too quick. No one can touch him. Almost comically, they hit each other as he dodges so quickly. Uh, lots of action and Matrix-style dodges. All this while, Luke is very quiet. He says absolutely nothing. He's just standing and dodging. No lightsaber, just dodging. Uh, Kylo eventually gets really pissed and starts swinging randomly, even getting some of his Imperial Guards killed because of him. We then see a scene of the Rattus, the final transport ship is launched. We cut back to Akbar and his wrist computer, he's hidden inside the, the Falcon. The timer on his computer says zero. He pushes a button on his arm, and then we cut back to a scene of the Rattus spinning around, aiming for the Supremacy, and his threat all being set to max. Akbar gets out of his hiding spot on the Falcon, locks and loads, and steps into the hangar and starts blowing away stormtroopers. Cut to Hux, who's on the bridge, who's freaking out. He orders everyone to attack the Rattus. They manage to get through its shields and damage it, but it's mostly intact. A technician tells Hux, we are detecting no life signs on the enemy cruiser. Finally, Hux figures out what is going on that's going to ram them and says, it's a trap. Cut to the hangar bay of the Supremacy, uh, Poe is faking with Chewbacca in cuffs, uh, trying to explain to some stormtroopers that the ship has the map to Luke Skywalker, yada yada, just stalling for time. Uh, and then suddenly they meet up with Rey, Finn, and Phasma outside the hangar. 
Uh, Poe freaks out, shoots the guard, you know, Chewbacca shoots Phasma, uh, but the bolt deflects off her helmet. Uh, Finn calms them down, and they run to the hangar. And of course, you know, in the hangar, Akbar already started firing, so there's already a firefight. And there's now a choke point at that hangar. Akbar provides covering fire while stormtroopers keep assaulting them. Uh, Phasma, uh, in the middle of all this, orders the troops to stand down, and they do, until more arrive and start shooting again. You know, Finn, Ray, and Poe get onto the Falcon. Uh, Akbar calls to Phasma to retreat, but she doesn't. Uh, so Akbar waves them away as Phasma uses herself as a shield and uses her blaster while Akbar keeps fighting as well. We then cut back to Kylo fighting Luke. There's like no guards left. Kylo has killed them all in his attempt to stop Luke. Suddenly the Radis not only rams into the supremacy, it also self-destructs. And we see the level of destruction as we did in the movie, obviously not in the same way, also because there's less Star Destroyers to be hit. This is done because we can't really have light speed ramming in the story. This is just as effective anyway. The interdictor's light speed suppression is gone, and the technician mentions that to Hux. There's a big commotion. Kyle looks around. Uh, he, you know, he falls over. All, that, all the big explosion occurred. Uh, Luke is nowhere to be found, and he's standing all alone as the Imperial Guards are all dead. Kylo is totally in a rage. He runs to the hangar. He just kills Akbar. He force chokes Phasma, uh, knocking her out at least. We don't know if she's alive or dead. Uh, and then the Falcon retreats to the planet, and the First Order begins launching shuttles. Uh, Kylo has his speech with Hux just on the hangar instead of in the throne room, and now Kylo is the Supreme Leader. So things happen on Crate pretty much like they do before. The blast shield is already down though, and the resistance is setting up shop there. They see the First Order advancing on them. The Falcon arrives, fights off TIE fighters. Some X-Wings start fighting, they, some of them get destroyed. Luke finally appears in his X-Wing, and only one of his four blasters are working. Uh, he takes out a few TIE fighters, he's at least a, still a good pilot. His ship is at least functioning. There's also no chase to stop the battering ram cannon with no plan and no weapons, so Finn doesn't need to learn how to pilot, and there was no plan anyway on how to stop the cannon as far as I can recall, nor is it explained how Finn and Poe would have gotten back to the base in time and safety. So the battering ram cannon fires, there's no reason for the thing to move or advance, it's a laser, it doesn't need to get close, a very large target. Uh, Finn and Chewbacca are helping fight off the TIE fighters in the Millennium Falcon, with Poe and Rey fighting over the flight controls of who's the better pilot, and then you throw in some porgs getting thrown around in the cockpit and hitting all the windows just for fun. Luke's then kamikazes his X-Wing into the battering ram cannon, jumps out of his X-Wing, walks into the hole with uh, the, the blast doors that the, the battering ram cannon made, and has his moment with Leia. Uh, they have their little scene, that's fine. And during this time, the Resistance is fighting off any advancement, and some are falling and Luke has to stop his, his conversation short and step outside. Luke walks out into the range of the AT-ATs. Uh, he gets totally bombarded by them. All the smoke covers the area. Hux orders them to stop firing in the same way as before. We then see that all the AT-AT bolts are just frozen in place. This is a callback to what Kylo did in the first movie. Kylo then screams to all the walkers to retreat, but it's too late. The bolts get sent back and nearly all of them get destroyed. Hux goes over Kylo's head and orders them all to keep firing, and then tell, tells the pilot of the shuttle to retreat. Luke pulls out his green lightsaber, and he reflects the bolts back, and the remaining AT-ATs get destroyed. So Kylo sees this, Force pushes Hux into the wall, and he orders the pilot to land, and he goes and faces Luke. Luke and Kylo argue about the Jedi, the Sith, you know, Luke apologizes to him, tells him he tried to stop Snoke, who was influencing him while he was being trained. He should have protected him better, but instead went into hiding, fearing that Snoke could have controlled him as well. He'd be preparing all this time to stop Snoke, and to hopefully find Kylo to apologize. 
Uh, here, Kylo explains why he's gone to the dark side. Uh, how much he hates Luke and Snoke and everything else. He just wants it all to go away. Uh, this is the typical message of nihilism from the movie, which is essentially what Snoke was trying to do. So Kylo hasn't really learned anything. He's still an angry little brat. Begin your epic lightsaber duel. Uh, you know, Luke can be doing all the, the saber forms and, and just demolishing Kylo. You, flips, whatever. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Uh, eventually, Luke sees the Falcon uh, during Kylo screaming at him and how he's going to kill Rey and everything he ever loved, etc., etc. You know, Kylo's just having his tantrum. So Luke then looks back to the entrance, nods to Leia, and then Leia nods back. So Leia's going to start retreating now. Uh, same deal with the Crystal Foxes, although it's Leia and she... You know, he's, she's sensitive to the Force, so she senses the foxes. Uh, she senses life and all that stuff, uh, being close to nature, and they go off into escape. The Falcon eventually stops fighting, and they land where Rey finds the exit place. She struggles to lift the rocks. She just can't do it. There's still people being died. There's X, uh, being killed. There's X-wings flying past and getting knocked out. She's she's getting scared. She starts lifting one of the rocks one at a time. That's all she can do. Uh, but she realizes she's causing a bit of an avalanche and they, they start falling further into the, the cave. So she's getting frantic, she's scared, and then she remembers her training. She remembers the first thing that Luke taught her, which was how to learn patience. So she slows down, she starts breathing, and ever so slowly the rocks start being pulled away from the hole. And it just, all of a sudden, all the rocks are just suspended in air. And those who were struggling to get out uh, can just push the rocks as if they're weightless and they fly away uh, and all the people start pushing them away and they start escaping. So, so Ray is just standing there and holding everything in, in place as they, as they run up to her. Cut back to Luke. Uh, he pulls an Obi-Wan. Kylo runs him through. There's nothing there. His lightsaber and his robotic hand just hit the ground and poof. So the same scene with Kylo and Ray. They sense each other from afar and the credits roll. And if there's going to be a stinger, then maybe that jar at the back of the room in the antechamber lights up. Maybe we see a foot or the door open and boom, fade to black. 